stocks closing the week with gains, gold hitting a record high, also about three quarters of the S&P 500 companies that have already reported earnings since April the 11th. They exceeded analyst forecasts. So let's try to put this all into some perspective. My next guest, Jim Glickenhaus. He manages $1.3 billion as the general partner at Glickenhaus and Company. And also with us, Bloomberg News finance reporter Jim Sterngold. Great to have you both with us. Jim, J uh, Jim and Jim, can I get to pick Jim Glickenhaus? You first. The stock market, as Deborah Carson was saying, just seems to want to go up. 4% increase in the month. Can we just expect this to continue? Well, what's not to like? I mean, there are 20 million Americans either underemployed or unemployed. You know, Ben Bernanke feels their pain. Donald wants you to know how wealthy he is. I mean, where are these problems? We have more debt than we can ever pay back. Um, you know, why shouldn't the market just keep going up forever? That's what I love about you. you got this nice, healthy sense of irony. Jim Sterngold, all right, take those points that Jim Glickenhaus just made. We've got unemployment, it's still what, 8.8%. Very close to All right, you had numbers coming out today showing that people are spending more on gasoline and food because of rising prices. We had Ben Bernanke's premier press conference this week basically saying, look, we know how to deal with these problems when inflation really becomes a problem. Come see me. I know how to take care of it. Do you think that this can just continue? It's either a lull before a storm and, and we're just being complacent, or indeed the liquidity is flowing so much. I mean, we're at a time when we have the luxury to have people running for president talking about birth certificates. When you have art prices that are zooming, I'm, I'm really astounded. I look at art as something of a proxy for the health of Wall Street. It may not reflect the health of Main Street. But uh, clearly th there is a relaxed atmosphere right now, and there's clearly liquidity behind it. Whether there's sound uh, asset buildup behind it, that's the question. Jim Glickenhaus, I was noting today that if you take a look at the Federal Reserve's programs, they have done exactly what they intended to do. They have produced a situation where you have very low interest rates. You have people continuing to buy, or somebody must be buying, those treasuries for those rates to go down. And on some level, there is inflation. They've done exactly what Ben Bernanke originally said he wanted to do, which was create some inflation. But has he created it by helping to actually move the economy ahead? Or are we creating it and there's no substance behind it? There's no economic oomph. Well, I think the amazing thing that happened this week was really what Walmart said when they said that their customers, by the end of the month, no are broke. Right, have no they money. They have no money, that their sales fall off a cliff towards the end of the month. I mean, this is the real world. The real world isn't people paying $35 million for Andy Warhols. Right. I mean, I bought an Andy Warhol for $5,000 from a guy who was building my house whose wife uh, left him, and he was left with this painting, and he begged me to take it. I didn't want to take it, and he hung it up on the wall, and as a mitzvah, I bought it from him. But the, the point is, the real world, people are suffering. I mean, they really are. And this is what kind of perplexes me. Now, I think uh, the Federal Reserve is between a rock and a hard place. I really do. I mean, there are problems out there. And if they had not done some of the things they did, we maybe could have had a catastrophe. But that being said, we have to stop spending money like this. We have to pay back our debt or our grandkids are going broke. All right. We're discussing some strong numbers in April. Good move for the stock market. The bond market, a lot of people buying treasuries. My guest is Jim Glickenhaus, general partner at Glickenhaus and Company. Also, we have Bloomberg News finance reporter Jim Sterngold. Jim, let's just turn our attention now uh, to stocks, but in a, in a different venue, because you've recently written a story having to do with a company called China Agritech. That's right. And why don't you explain a little bit about it? Because what has been in the news has been this whole reverse merger concept having to do with companies in China backing into shell corporations in the United States that already have a listing but might be dormant or defunct. And so they use this listing to actually get shareholders to pony up some money. What happened at China Agritech? That's right. Th this has been an area that is both very hot and very treacherous. And I love this story because it's really about everything happening at once. China Agritech, as you said, did a reverse merger. They bought what had at one time been Argyle Mining in Nevada. It was a shelf uh, company. It was an empty shell but had a listing. So it was acquired by this Chinese company that makes organic fertilizers. They used that to get the U.S. listing, put their assets into that shell. That's why it's the reverse merger, because it looks like the shell bought them. 
Well, then they were able to sell uh, stock to the public. Carlyle, the big private equity firm, bought 20% of them, did very well. A asset manager in New York with a great reputation named Glickenhaus and Company decided that this was a great opportunity to get involved in producing food for this huge country, but in an environmentally responsible way. The only problem was that problems started to crop up soon afterwards. And on top of the company's own problems with its auditor and things like that, the short sellers started to circle. It was a bear attack, a classic. The only question was, was anything that the short sellers were saying, because they were going wild in the blogs, was any of it true? They were talking about the company being a complete scam, not having any real operations, and being basically an opportunity to pick the pockets of gullible Americans. And the fact is, we don't know exactly what the facts are. You've got the shorts who are laughing because the stock plummeted. You've got the long-term investors saying, I know that I'm going to have my vengeance. The question is when. Jim Glickenhaus, you're, you're here not just because we're talking about the markets, but specifically China Agritech. How did you come to get involved with this firm? Well, in, in any way that you get involved with any company, I mean, I think that the opportunities in the United States are, for various reasons, somewhat finite, and we've done very well investing in companies that uh, sell to China. I mean, probably the biggest success we've had in many years has been Fortescue, which we bought at 12 cents and is now at uh, $7 American. And uh, we have millions and millions of shares of that. So uh, we looked into China. We feel they have a lot of people. Um, the one thing that I think their government realizes is, is if they don't feed them, they could have massive problems. And uh, we looked at this company. It had earnings. It had revenue. Uh, it had earnings that were audited of about a dollar a share. And uh, we talked to them and felt that they had good growth prospects. As Jim said, you know, shortly thereafter, a short seller named who called himself Lucas McGee, issued this report, which basically said they didn't exist. Uh, the interesting thing here is, is that we don't think Lucas McGee exists. I mean, we sent investigators to where his alleged office was, and there was no one there by that name. There's no one registered with the Hong Kong authorities um, as a security analyst, and he never answered any questions we posed to him or answered phone calls. Um, now, did you go visit the company in China? Yeah, we actually did. Uh, Jesse, uh, we sent Jesse over there. Your son, my son, and um, he visited the company in China. He <coughs> went to uh, their factory. He watched them make a hundred. Uh, tons, metric tons, of fertilizer in one day. He went to stores that sold their products. He looked at cash register receipts. He met the research scientists and spoke to them about what they were doing. And uh, he made a blog about it, which we put on our website. And he actually made a, a, a YouTube video of the uh, things being manufactured. So you believe the company's the real deal? Well, here's the thing. We believe that, yes, well, we do. Um, another short seller, John Hempton, uh, claimed, well, Jesse was taken to a Potemkin village. Now, here's the reason I think that that's silly. You know, I was in the motion picture business. I wrote and directed and produced eight theatrical motion pictures. And I have some idea as to how much and how complex it is to stage things. Uh, they would have had to stage a factory, workers, uh, made 100 metric tons of stuff, trucks, patented the trucks to look like they were old with their logos, then built a bunch of stores in different places, stocked it with the product, had people come in and buy it, made cash register receipts. You know, I, I just don't think it's credible. And the strongest reason that I believe it's a real company is if they were a fraud, they wouldn't still exist meaning they would be gone. They would have taken whatever cash they had, and they would be gone. You can't subpoena someone from China. Right, they, they would have gone out and necessarily hired new auditors, right, Jim? Because this is also what's happened, is they have to go out and get some new auditors see, that, that's to look after the That's another piece of this. The company, meanwhile, was shooting itself in the foot. If it was trying to establish its credibility, it fired two auditors in a span of three months. Not good. It's late with its 2010 reports. Not good. So it, it helped create some of the problems. The Carlisle board members suddenly quit without a word of explanation. Not good. And uh, Jesse Glickenhaus, so I admire his pluck. He actually said, I'm an investor. I own a piece of this company. I'm going to go check it out. The only problem is he left the door open to these kinds of questions because he, had, he did have the company show him around. As Jim points out, it would be awfully hard to have recreated a fertilizer company from scratch like that. But it opened the, left the door open enough that the shorts could continue to claim this is a scam. It, to me, the real story is this shows you how treacherous 
this market could be. It, it could be a home run. It could end up as a great stock, but it could also be delisted, even if it is a real company, because the door is left open to these kinds of attacks. All right, we're going to continue the conversation because it brings up a couple interesting points. It's not only just investing in China, for example, but it's this idea of doing due diligence and doing it yourself and then believing in the story and then sort of reconciling all these things and perhaps even making some money. All right, we've got more with uh, Jim Sterngold of uh, Bloomberg News and more with Jim Glickenhaus of Glickenhaus and Company. Jim, as we've been discussing, you're the author of this story having to do with China Agritech, Jim Glickenhaus, the investor. The stock, I believe, still halted because we really don't know what's real and what's not real. But having said that, does this kind of point out the confluence of a couple things? Investing in China which is far away from most investors, so they don't get to actually get on a plane and go. The concept of a reverse merger, which might be a little bit outside the can of most sophisticated investors, mm -hmm. but particularly the Internet, where you don't know the quality of the information, you don't know where it comes from. Well, that's true, and there are a lot of people who will talk about their brilliant analysis going over a balance sheet and being able to judge a company based on its debt or its assets or something. The question is, are the assets really there? China, and this experience with China Agritech, gets back to, as you were saying, Pim, the absolute fundamental, which was kicking the tire, not figuratively. <laughs> kicking Literally. the tire. You've got to go and look. <laughs> exactly. To see. I remember I was in Hong Kong in the early 1980s when it was just opening, and this was a great, wonderful new frontier. And I remember lots of foreign businessmen, American and European, coming through Hong Kong, going into China, and saying when they came back, you know what, we have to teach them how to do business all over again. They really, uh, from all these years under the uh, Maoist dictatorship, they really don't understand. And many of these people were completely fleeced. The Chinese did a fantastic job of saying, you know, if you build us a new school and new hospital, we'll show goodwill and we'll be more likely to allow you to invest in our factories. And of course, many of these were great successes, but many more were, were terrible, terrible scams. And I think today the same uh, sorts of treacherous waters are out there. Jim Clickenhaus, this idea of actually going to visit a company used to be standard operating procedure. You'd go and take a factory tour, you'd go and meet the executives. Has that changed? Well, I think it has changed. I mean, I think people think that because of the Internet, they can just read what people say on blogs and make a decision. And I think you really do have to look at things. But in this case, I think it's a little more complex. You know, there's a guy who's probably having a nervous weekend uh, who used to run a hedge fund galleon waiting to see what the jury says. That's right. About Raj, trading. Raj Rotten, right? Exactly. Uh, trading on insider information. Well, the obverse is just as true, meaning if you manipulate a stock, for financial gain and spread rumors and short the stock, uh, this is a very serious issue. I mean, you can be found civilly guilty, you can be found criminally guilty, you can go to jail for it. And in this particular case, I mean, we have turned over things that we've uncovered to the FBI, the SEC, the Australian regulators, and the Chinese regulators. And I mean, just today, we had further discussions with uh, one of these groups who asked us for some more information. So um, just as it's very treacherous not to look with your own eyes, it's also very treacherous to attempt to manipulate the market by spreading rumors and things that are just patently untrue. And I think in this case, uh, it very well may turn out that some of that went on. What about the, uh, the, the some of the blogs that have been written by, I guess it's uh, John Hempton? Yes. And who is he and what, how is he involved in this? Well, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, Hempton is uh, a guy who has a blog on uh, China Agritech. And, you know, he said, I, I sent, first he said, I staked out the company, uh, which he then admitted he didn't do. He then said, well, I sent an American lawyer to stake it out. And then, as Jesse pointed out, uh, the building that he went to wasn't China Agritech's factory. The picture that he posted wasn't China Agritech's. And so his statement that, well, when we asked the security guard if he'd ever heard of China Agritech, and he said no, I mean, what does it prove? It proves nothing. And the other thing is, when Hempton sent an email to the board member who wound up resigning and threatened her and uh, the auditor, Ernst and & Young, um, and point blank said, you know this company is a fraud and um, I'm not going to release this 
email until after the audit comes out, but then you're going to make a great defendant. And I know, and these are his words, scummy uh, lawyers, ambulance chasers who effectively were going to sick on you. I think this raises some very serious questions of torturous interference with contractual obligations. And, uh, you know, these are some of the points we're making with uh, the various regulators involved in it. So, Have you ever met this guy, John Hampton? Uh, no. no. He, he sent me, you know, a stream. I've spoken to him on the phone. You have? Yeah, yeah. Several and times. What, what, and what, what's, what do you get gleaned from him? Well, he, he speaks with enormous confidence. He speaks, uh, you know, absolutely insisting that he has compelling, incontrovertible evidence that this company is a complete shell and a scam. Did he share the evidence with you? He shared similar to what Jim was just saying, that he has had people scope out their factories, that they're absolutely empty, that they... Oh, one of his big uh, points was that he claims to have obtained the electricity usage figures for the factories, and that a, a full functioning factory would use vast amounts of power to operate its machinery and whatnot, and that the actual usage is minuscule. It's about what a, a house you, or something... How do you get the electricity well, usage of a, of a factory? that's where things get a little fuzzy. He doesn't tell you that, but and he claims... Jesse, uh, actually confidence. investigated that, and uh, the owners of China Agritech said that electricity is not a separate line item. It's part of the rent, that there aren't meters, and that the uh, that data is not story. data he could get. So, uh, now, there is one other thing here. Jesse has publicly challenged Hempton, specifically on many points, and he's not answering them. We've got to leave it there. Keep us informed. Jim Glickenhaus, Jim Sterngold, appreciate your insights. Coming up, the Sokol scandal in Omaha.